NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the biggest storylines with comments from key guests in the college and high school NIL space. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome into another week and another pre-draft edition of the Strictly Stripes podcast. Muhammad Ahmad, Andrew Gillis, and Mike Nislik back after a nice weekend, a beautiful weekend. For those of you in the Cincinnati area, looking outside right now, it's just gorgeous. I think it's supposed to be like this all week, fingers crossed. Uh, looking like sunny and 75 later this week, so how about that? Uh, and a really great way to kick off our week is kind of picking up where we left off last week with our uh, draft positional questions and previews. Uh, we've talked about a lot of positions. we talked about tight end, running back, uh, cornerback. And offensive tackle, specifically right tackle, of course. Um, and this is, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this position I'm about to mention, but I think, you know, we have to spend some time on it because it is a position of need for the Bengals in terms of depth, uh, and that is the safety position. Of course, you know, they just signed uh, Nick Scott in free agency after Von Bell and Jesse Bates left. They have Dax Hill. They'll have Tyson Anderson hopefully helping next year, but you need at least one more guy in that room to be with all of those names and Michael Thomas, of course. Um, and I would imagine it's not the highest priority for the Bengals, but a priority nonetheless. So really, before I kind of ask you guys, like if there's a name you have in mind, and I'll kind of tease where Andrew and I are leaning towards this, and I'll explain why, but what is the earliest in the draft the Bengals should you know, consider the idea of a safety? Like how early do you go and why do you go no earlier than that. I mean, I think it, it, it certainly depends on, on what the board is. Uh, I mean, if you're sitting there in round two and, and I mean, if the Bengals board has, has a safety that was ranked 24th or something like that, if you're sitting there second round, I mean, then take a safety, like take the, I'm, I'm in the, you know, pretty strictly in the best player available category. Um, so you know, I, I, I don't know if I would put a round on it, I think what this team needs, though, is is depth at safety. You know, you made the investment in Dax Hill last summer, or I guess last April, and you kind of were waiting for this day for a year now, and now it's here. So Dax Hill's there. You made the investment in Nick Scott. Like, to me, this is just – it's not – a position of need in the way that, you know, running back or tight end is where you could make an argument. They still need a starter there. Uh, you know, you need, you got to let uh, Scott and Hill kind of sink or swim. So, you know, I, I, I would lean depth, but if, if there's a guy in the second round, third round, pull the trigger. Yeah. I think that'd be kind of crazy uh, just cause you're not going to play them. I mean, likely, I mean, uh, you know, you, you're investing into Dex Hill. You got that first round pick there. Uh, you signed Nick Scott, uh, to a multi-year deal, so I, I'm not sure that that makes much sense. The problem is, is that this draft is not very good uh, at safety, and so there's a real big yep. gap, uh, especially once you get past like the first or second round projection guys. Uh, the back end of this draft is very weak, and so I'm not sure there's much value to sort of say, you know, draft a guy in the fifth or sixth round when most likely those guys could be nabbed as undrafted free agents. Um, you know, there's some some good prospects at the top end of this draft, but I just don't see, I mean, I think there's only one projected first rounder, you know, from what I've seen. In, You're uh, probably thinking Branch. of Brian Branch from Alabama. Yeah, from Alabama. So, um, you know, I'm not sure how that would work in terms of the first round, but you know, there's some other guys in the second round, but still, I just don't see um, drafting a guy on day one or two at safety. But then at the same time, if, if that's the case, I'm not sure there's a guy worth drafting on day three. So, um you know, I, I think it's kind of a, a tough spot there and at safety in terms of this draft. I might sit this one out there at the position and, you know, try to take a flyer on some undrafted guys, see if you find somebody like, um, you know, for those rookie mini camps and see if they can stick on uh, into training camp. So, Mike, you're saying the Bengals shouldn't even entertain the idea of a safety in the draft. They should wait until it's all said and done and basically sign an undrafted free agent is what you're saying. Well, yeah, I, I don't think – I mean, bottom line is I don't think they should draft one on day one or two. 
Uh, if they want to draft one on day three because they, you know, are really high on somebody, that's, you know, based on their board, um, but just based on kind of what the analysts are saying and, and kind of some of the stuff, you know, you look at the, these prospects, it's just not a very deep draft. Um, so why, you know, overdraft somebody when you could get somebody as an undrafted free agent? But, I, I mean, there's less of a downside to drafting somebody on, on day three, obviously, because a lot of those guys are projects anyway. Um you know, but, uh, but, but my main point is just that day one, day two, I don't think they have a positional need there um, that doesn't really fit with what they, they need to do in this draft. So, Andrew, to kind of bounce off of that, you were saying that if there's somebody the Bengals really like, you know, they should go for it. I mean, I mentioned Brian Branch. He's pretty much the favored safety in this draft. He's top 20 and PFF's top 20. His grades are amazing. I mean, is that really the only guy the Bengals consider? Like, if Brian Branch is somehow on the board in the second round, maybe not the first round, but the second round, do you actually say, okay, maybe we've got something here? Or is it too risky, like Mike said, and you just move on and pick a bigger position of need? Yeah, I mean, if Branch is there, I think you have to consider it just, again, you know, just because, like I said, I I am very much in the – you know, in the, in the kind of mold of, you know, take the best player you can take the best player that's available because, you know, it might not be a need now, but you know, what happens when, you know, somebody hurts their knee or, you know, somebody gets a concussion or whatever, or, you know, you can, you can diversify your looks. Like if you really like the, uh, the, uh, the safety out of Boise state, uh, jail Skinner, like what, I mean, he's a six foot four player, you can kind of use him in, in different ways and you can diversify your defense in different ways where, you know, Hey, maybe now you run three safety sets, you know, you can, you can do that and, and you don't need to put an extra corner on the field and jail can kind of be a box player. Like there, there's different ways to do this. So, you know, I, I, I really don't like crossing anybody off the board, you know, really pretty much aside from quarterback, just because, you know, there's not – you never know what's going to happen in this league. And, I mean, if you have a chance – like, if you think of – like, if, if you're splitting hairs, if all things are even, yeah. I mean, take the tight end, take the running back, take the tack, take whoever over a safety. But, I mean, if a safety is is the highest player on your board and, you know, you're sitting there, okay, take them, sure. Interesting. Well – I'm kind of glad you mentioned that because, uh, and this is where I kind of wanted to read your mind, a.k.a. I read your mock draft. And ironically, you and I, Andrew, not only picked the same guy in the fifth round, but we did it like like literally our mock drafts were a day apart. We both selected Anthony Johnson Jr. out of Iowa State, same guy, and we picked him in the same round. In the fifth round, the Bengals have the 100. 100- 63rd overall pick in the fifth round. Um, and, I mean, Andrew, you're probably going to say a lot of the same things I'm going to say, but I'll let you kind of take the lead. I mean, obviously, Johnson was available, I guess, in your simulator like he was in mine. But what led you to pick him over maybe, say, like another depth piece at tackle or another depth piece at the O-line or maybe even another tight end? Because I actually selected two tight ends in mine. I mean, what was kind of your reasoning for picking him and picking him at that round at that point? Yeah, I mean, well, when you get to when you get to the later rounds, I mean, to me, the NFL draft once you hit probably day three, you're you're in a different mindset. I think you are than in you know days one and two, where you know day like whoever the Bengals draft day one, you would expect that player to be a starter either this year or at the very latest next year. Uh, but when you get to day three. You know, you're talking pretty much three archetypes of players that you would kind of look to take. Uh, the first one is a player who's maybe injured, uh, you know, a player who you if you think you can get them healthy, you can maybe get a bit of a steal. You know, a player had, you know, some some kind of whatever it is, something that held them back in college. Um, you know, there's that. Um, you've got the small school guys. You know, maybe you're drafting a guy from the FCF, FCS level you know, a, a G5 conference. And then the third one is kind of what Anthony Johnson Jr. is, where you're, you're drafting a productive player who played at a Big Ten or a Big Ten school, or excuse me, Big 12 school. Um, get ahead of myself. They're going to move eventually, I would think. But um, the uh, <laughs> you know, you're getting a guy who played in the Power Five, and he, he played a long time. He was a team captain. Uh, you know, he played corner, played safety. And when you get to the end of the draft, like the good players from big schools are gone. You know, the, the best players, you know, the guys who are going to be starters from, you know, Baylor and, 
Utah and, and all those schools, like those, those guys are gone. So you, you're drafting players kind of in those three molds. And I think that with Johnson, I like his versatility. I like that he played multiple different, uh, different positions in college. That can kind of get you, uh, that can kind of get you some, you know, some different looks on your defense. And I mean, again, it, it's a safe pick late in the round or late in the draft where you, you know exactly what you're going to get. So uh, I just kind of thought that that made sense to me because, you know, they, they need some depth there and might as well take a player who's really experienced and, you know, has, has played a couple different spots. And, you know, to that point, I mean, obviously Trey Flowers hasn't re-signed yet. He may not even re-sign at all. And so, you know, maybe you get a guy like him, you could maybe use him in the nickel. Maybe you obviously use him at safety if, God forbid, you know, someone like Dax Hill or Nick Scott gets hurt. You, you get a lot for such a low pick. I think that's kind of like a bargain in that case. I honestly think um, Antonio Johnson from Texas A&M, that's another guy I was looking at. He was way off the board in my mock draft at that point. But, like, if I was, like, fourth round and he was there, I might have been like, okay, I think, you know, this is a guy that you can get, even though there was, like, guys like Kobe Turner from, you know, Wake Forest, who I think is a very underrated D tackle I would have picked. But I think, you know, you know, like for me, if I were to pick a safety, like I didn't mind, I, I wouldn't pick earlier than the fourth round. Brian Branch is an interesting case. And I, I mentioned, you know, uh, who I just mentioned with Antonio Johnson. But even then, like if I'm picking him, I'm not picking him early in the fourth round. So if it's third round, I'm passing. But if it's fourth round and I'm comfortable with tackle, running back and tight end, and it's like, okay, you know, I need an interior rusher, but maybe I'll get, a, you know, a sneaker pick in the you know, fifth round or something. But, I mean, for you, Mike, obviously you're not leaning towards safety like I mentioned. But, like, if there's any guys that are available in day three, like, are there any guys that would catch your attention that you think the Bengals should entertain? Not on day three. Like I said, I mean, if you look at most of them, you know, athletically, they're grading out towards being undrafted free agents. And I don't think, um, you know, you should use a pick, I think. You know, one of the guys that's, in, you know, a second rounder that's a little bit um, intriguing is Jordan Battle, uh, Brian Branch's yep. teammate at Alabama, uh, more of a free safety type. Um, you know, it has the versatility to work in the slot. So, you know, when you have a guy like Mike Hilton, like that's how Dax Hill kind of started out, um, might work. You know, I, I think you need to get, if you're going to draft a safety, you know, ha- use them in multiple spots early because there's not going to be much, um, you know, playing time available. So he'd need to be kind of the backup at, you know, probably all the spots. Um, you know, not not necessarily kind of an in-the-box guy, but still, um, it, you know, I think they like those guys that have that pedigree of playing at Alabama, playing at a high level in the SEC, um, you know, produced in, in college. Uh, it's got the measurables, 6'1", 209, 455, 40-yard dash. But, no, day three I would avoid it just because, like I said, I don't think there's a prospect that, um, out there uh, that you wouldn't be able to arguably sign as an undrafted free agent. You know, I think that that's not an unrealistic option for the Bengals because, I mean, you look at the room right now. I mean, they have Alan George, undrafted rookie out of Vanderbilt last year, made the 53-man roster. I mean, they signed Mike Hilton two years ago. He was undrafted out of Ole Miss, and he kind of had to climb his way in Pittsburgh, you know, where he took off. And then, obviously, he plays special teams, but Mike Thomas, safety, he was undrafted out of Stanford. He's playing in the league, you know, 10-plus years later. So, I mean, they, they could definitely go down that route. I don't think that's, you know, unlikely, especially because you look at specifically how many undrafted players they have in their secondary. And I think, you know, with, with guys like that, you know, you think of Joe Bocci, you think of Marcus Bailey, you know, Bailey, seventh-round pick, Bocci, undrafted, Clay Johnson, seventh-round pick, They I think they signed off waivers when they got him. I mean, they use those guys on special teams. They value backup defenders on special teams. And so, you know, you could look at maybe an undrafted free agent, whether it's some of the names that Andrew mentioned or you go even further down the list, like guys like Trey Dean or Chamari Corner. Uh, by the way, did you cover Chamari Corner at Virginia Tech, Mike? I was looking at him and I thought of you. Did you cover him? Chamari Corner, yeah. I would not draft Chamari Corner. No? <laughs> no? Would you not sign him to an undrafted free agent deal? Uh, I mean, yeah, if you want to. A, a body, sure, but I mean, I don't think he's going to. Uh, I guess some people have him as a projected day three pick, but yeah, I don't see it. Well, I was going to say, I'm glad I mentioned that because I was thinking, oh, wait, maybe Mike knows about him because, you know, you were the Virginia Tech insider at one point. But yeah, it, whether it's him or whoever, um, it could work out. And, and history would point in, in favor of, you know, the Bengals in that sense. But when we come back, we're going to completely shift gears and talk a lot about 
wide receiver because uh, that is the buzz of the AFC North right now with Odell Beckham's signing to the Ravens. Talk about what that means and for the Bengals. Much more to come right here on the Strictly Stripes podcast. All right, and thanks for staying with us on the Strictly Stripes podcast. Before we jump back into our discussion on wide receivers, I want to remind you guys to sign up for Cincinnati Football Insider. Uh, it is our subtext service. It's awesome. It's fun. We text you directly all the breaking news, analysis, and awesome insights and opinions on the Bengals before anybody else gets in, including social media. Go to cleveland.com slash Bengals. Click on the blue banner at the top of the page. And fear not, if you're not sure if you want to pay $4.99 a month, you get a two-week free trial, but trust me, once you sign up, you're not going to cancel it because it is a lot of fun. Make sure you sign up, cleveland.com slash Bengals. Of course, the AFC North uh, just got a lot more loaded at wide receiver, guys. OBJ finally has a team after 15 months. He is a Baltimore Raven, so he is back uh, in the AFC North after he played with the Browns for a couple seasons before going to the Rams. And funny enough, guys, the last team he played was the Bengals in the Super Bowl. And he caught a touchdown in that game. Um, and he played against the Bengals multiple times a year in Cleveland. So uh, Lou Anarumo and the Bengals are going to have their hands full with him again. Um, there's obviously no shortage of familiarity there. But, I mean, you look at the deal. One year, $18 million guaranteed. I mean, they're they're paying him, especially when you think about his age. He's in his you know early 30s. He tore his ACL in the Super Bowl, like I mentioned. I mean, that, you know, I think it's not a head scratcher. I mean, there's room for debate there. But I, I think it definitely caught people's attention. Um, but, you know, you think about the AFC North, like the Bengals have T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. The Browns still have Amari Cooper, who's got some juice in the tank, and, you know, Elijah Moore, which I think was a great pickup. And then the Steelers still have, you know, Deontay Johnson and George Pickens, who Pickens is on the come up. Johnson's not bad at his position. I mean, you just look at OBJ joining the Ravens. Like, does that make the AFC North, like, one of the most stacked divisions in football in terms of wide receiver? Is it overrated? Is it decent? Like, what do you guys think? Well, I, I think with with OBJ, uh, you know, he's fifteen million guaranteed. You sign a contract up to eighteen, um, right? Fifteen know, guaranteed. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about this in a, in a couple of minutes. But um, you know, I, I think that it it kind of says a lot about the market. But as a you know, what it means for the division, I, I think it. You know, I wrote about this in subtext today. I think it kind of underscores the the need for for dbs in this league um you know i've mentioned this before and you know we've talked about it in regards to offensive linemen you know duke tobin said you know there you know more teams want offensive linemen than there are good offensive linemen i think the same applies for dbs uh and receivers and you know it's a passing league and you've got a team that has committed to running the ball like no other team has committed to running the ball for the last four years and now they're desperate for receiver. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, like I said, we'll get into that in a minute. But they're adding a receiver, and they're really desperate to add receivers. So, you know, I think it just kind of underscores how how important that position is in today's NFL. Um, and again, like, you look at the Ravens, I don't I don't hate their, their skill positions. I mean, if, if Lamar Jackson's not there, then there's no point in having this conversation. But, uh, you know, I like Rashad Bateman. OBJ, I think, is, is a bit overrated. I think people are kind of looking at this move and, you know, hey, should should the Browns and the Bengals and the Steelers, like, you know, should all these teams start to be on the watch for their – no, like, OBJ is good when he's healthy, uh, but you don't know if he can be healthy. And you don't know – I mean, he's certainly not kind of what he was at the beginning of his career. So, um, you know, their skill position definitely improved, especially when you consider Bateman, who missed, you know, the majority of last season, is going to be back. They, uh, I, I just – I think it's a nice, solid signing for the Ravens, but it says a lot more kind of about where the position is headed across the league. Is it, though? I mean, they let everybody go in free agency. They cut, uh, you know, you, you, they, they've parted ways with guys that were, were still with. They've lost probably, what, 10 starters from last year? Oh, no, not 10. Um, Some about the Ravens? Yeah. Not I 10. think, no, I think... Maybe it's not a 10, but no, Mike is right. They've lost a lot of guys. Like, that's why I, I graded the Ravens pretty poorly in free agency. Calais Campbell's gone. Um, they cut him, yeah. Yeah, they they moved on from – Ben Powers. They traded Chuck Clark. Yeah, Chuck Ben Powers Clark. left. Ben Powers left. Peters isn't signed. Peters Justin is still Houston a free isn't signed. The Peters thing I'm interested in because I think the Peters thing might be 
them trying to figure out their cap situation with the Lamar stuff. Um, so Pierre Paul, Houston Peters, was Fuller a starter? Who? Uh, no. No, no. But so that's yeah. three. He was Park hurt, too. Four. Campbell's five. Ben Powers is six. Oliver was part of their kind of trio of starting tight ends, right? Yeah, but he, I yeah, mean, that, he left. That's a, I mean, I don't know, but that's akin to, you know, losing, you know, I, I mean, that's akin to the Bengals losing Devin Asiasi or Mitchell Wilcox. But I, I'm still saying they lost, they lost a decent amount of talent here. They did, and, absolutely. And, and like, they only have five picks in this year's draft. And they didn't sign anybody to replace any of that talent. Um, well, but, didn't they get Nelson Aguilar? I think they got him from New England, right? Yeah, they brought in yeah. Aguilar, but I, but he's again, a receiver, so that's also not at the, yeah. any of the positions we mentioned. So yeah, like um, yeah, I, I mean, they're, <laughs> like their 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 top receiver in that playoff game was Demarcus Robinson, and and he's still unsigned. Like next year, I mean, but <sighs> it feels to me it, the, <laughs> with all due respect, Muhammad, that, I, I'm just not roster, sure what you're losing. They had a cap. They're they're in a cap crunch. Still a body. Their, their roster is falling apart. Um, sure. And you know you spend eighteen million dollars on a receiver that oh by the way hasn't played in two years and your quarterback doesn't want to be on the team. So <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you know, I, what are you getting out of Odell Beckham? I mean, he's coming off a torn ACL. He's going to be thirty-one in middle next season. I mean, maybe you get a hundred a thousand yards season if he's healthy, but like that seems to be off. You know, that's like best case, best case scenario, and every spot on your roster is weaker. So, except receiver, maybe, but like, yeah, I, I don't know. It just a, did the signing didn't make much sense to me. Um, you know, considering the state of their their roster, um, I pointed out on subtext this morning that I, I think it highlights just how you know I don't think the AFC North did much in free agency. You know, you talk about people being disappointed maybe the Bengals only did the Orlando uh, Brown Jr. signing but um, you know you look across the league and it's uh, you know or this division and I said maybe the best move so far is the Elijah Moore trade and then what else you know um, outside of Cincinnati uh, it, I just think it highlights how little these teams have done you know uh, not 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 much I think step forward you know th- these rosters uh, you know outside of the Bengals I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I was talking with Mary Kay Cabot about this. I think the Browns actually did pretty good. Like, I mean, aside from Elijah Moore, they got Juan Thornhill. They got Ogbo Okwanonkro from, uh, I think he came from the Texans. I mean, uh, I forget his name. They got Dalvin that one Thomas guy from Dalvin Tomlinson. Like, yeah, they got him from Minnesota. I mean, they they did pretty good, I think. I don't know. I'm, so I kind of disagree with you there, Mike. for a bunch of middling defensive line, pros, uh, you know, 26, you know, Tomlinson's even 29. I mean, dude. Well, but I mean, yeah, but look, look, yeah, but look who's calling the shots, though. But Jim so Schwartz. Here, here's, so, but here, I think, I mean, was that, this, that underscores the, the kind of the, the look at those rosters, though, I think, doesn't it? Because you can add all of these, because like the Ravens can add, like, Again, I don't think it's like the Ravens are sitting at 22. It doesn't sound like Jackson Smith and Jig was going to be there. But I mean, what if you, what if Quentin Johnston's there? What if Zay Flowers is there? Like that doesn't take, uh, you know, that doesn't take, uh, you know, those guys off the board. And again, I, we, we can, you can add all the receivers in the world. The Ravens can draft another receiver and, you know, really upgrade their receiver room, but it doesn't matter what's going to happen unless the quarterback is solved. I think the same thing with the Browns where it's, Elijah Moore could be really good and maybe New York was just not a fit and it didn't work for him. But if Deshaun Watson's not going to be Deshaun Watson, it doesn't matter. So I, I don't know. I think, you know, a lot of this is you could have a great off season. You could have a bad off season, but if your quarterback is good, then you're fine. Yeah. I mean, well, I think, I don't Sean know. Watson I think the more one is interesting. Go Deshaun ahead. Mike. Watson has to be a lot more than good for the Browns to be good. I do agree with that. I mean, if you're bringing in all those guys, especially at wide receiver, I mean, yeah, there's no excuse, especially if you still have, you know, Nick Chubb behind you. But to kind of get, you know, the OBJ talk kind of focused on, like, the Bengals side, I mean, you think about T. Higgins. I mean, we don't know if he's going to get extended and when that's going to happen. But, I mean, if you look at OBJ getting $18 million, I mean, I get it. 
he was one of the best in the league at one point. I understand he won a Super Bowl and he might have a lot of juice in the tank, but I mean, if you think about it, like T. Higgins is probably looking at that, and he's looking at other guys making eighteen million, like Christian Kirk in Jacksonville. I mean, Deontay Johnson, perfect example, making under eighteen and a half million in Pittsburgh. Terry McLaurin's making about twenty-two in Washington. I mean, he's probably looking at those guys. Where I think you can make a case that T. Higgins is just as good, if not better, than those names I mentioned. And you see OBJ making that kind of money with all of the questions that we just talked about about his health and his age and stuff. I mean. Is that maybe like a, a good benchmark for T where it's like, hey, I mean, I should be making not just what those guys are making. I should be making more because, I mean, you look at his numbers, you look at his traits, his PFF grades. I mean, he easily matches or beats out those guys. I mean, like, th- does that kind of set a standard now for the Bengals if they're going to give T Higgins an extension? Or do you think that's just a one-shot wonder with the Ravens that has nothing to do with it in terms of the market? I don't think they have much to do with anything, each other, just because they're – two people on very different uh, parts of their career. I think T. Higgins is going to be asking for more than 20, um, but that was sort of the baseline way before Odell Beckham Jr. signed. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you like if if you kind of look at the, the receiver contracts in the league, I mean, DJ Moore, 20.6 million, Terry McLaurin, yep. 23.2 million, Debo, 23.8 million, Stephon Diggs and DK Metcalf, 24, like, that to me is where if I'm T Higgins, that to me is where I'm kind of starting and saying, Hey, I, you know, I I'm comparable to these players. This is what I want. Um, I think it's a one-off. I don't think you can really learn a ton from the OBJ thing it, as a, as a contract signing, because if you look at kind of the history of the Ravens, um, you know, and, and Mike kind of mentioned what, what's going on with the rest of their roster right now. I mean, their their defense is getting older. They need to add a lot of youth on defense. Um, their quarterback situation's a mess. Like, you know, it, 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 from everything that you read, it sounds like OBJ and Lamar kind of talk this thing out. And, I mean, that matters. But, again, the Ravens, really, since they've became the Ravens, like the best drafted receiver that they've probably ever had is Torrey Smith. Like I agree. Think, if you think, what about what about Anquan Bolden? Anquan, I mean, they they they. Uh, I forget if they traded for or signed, traded for him or, or they signed him. No, they traded. Yeah, because um, he used to play for the Cardinals. Never yeah, mind. He put, yeah, yeah, he got drafted for the card. But like, I, I think that I mean, Steve Smith, obviously free agent signing. Like the Ravens have kind of always done this, where they haven't really drafted or they haven't really drafted receiver well. So this just you kind of look at it, and this was a team desperate to add at receiver not only because of their their history with drafting receivers, but also because of everything that's kind of going on around the roster. So, again, I, you look at what this is, and, like, OBJ, I don't think the contract is that insane. I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, Muhammad, you mentioned some guys like, you know, Allen Robinson, 15.5, Hunter Renfro, 15.8, Mike Evans, 16.5, Tyler Lockett, 17.3. Like, that's kind of the ballpark that, that OBJ's in. But I does think it, I, I do think it, go, it goes to show, I mean, T. Higgins is, is a really valuable piece. And if he hits the free agent market, he's going to make a lot of money. And I agree. If you let T. Higgins, I think that, look, I, I think there's a, lot, a very, very, very valid argument to make. And I might even be on the side of that argument the more I think about it, that it might not be good business to bring back T. Higgins and Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow just because Whoa. you can't commit more than $100 million maybe to three different players like that. That's a lot. And you know, if, if you're going to do that, that's fine. Cause T Higgins is a really, really good player. I'm just saying that if you do let go of T Higgins, if T Higgins does get traded, which is kind of what I would presume they would do, they would do the, the AJ Brown sign and trade thing. If T yeah. Higgins is no longer on the team, that's kind of the market that you're in. If you're not drafting receivers, you're looking at, okay, we have to take a chance on Odell Beckham jr. Who's coming off an ACL who hasn't played in a season because that's just what we need to pay. So, you know, th- there's a lot that goes into it. I think that, that you can draw some parallels, but not a ton to kind of what this means moving forward. I think what it, when I said it meant a lot for the AFC North moving forward, I just think that it, it goes to show that receivers cost a lot of money and you're going to have to pay up for them one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting. I know, like I said, we, we've talked so much about, you know, should the Bengals pay T. Higgins and what does that mean for Joe Burrow? But, I mean, let's think about this. I mean, do you – maybe I've posed this question before, but if even if I have, I'm going to pose it again since it's relevant. 
I mean, do you see a world where the Bengals extend T. Higgins before they extend Joe Burrow, or is that just ludicrous? But do you say T. Higgins before Joe Burrow? Yeah, like they they lock down T. Higgins before they lock down Joe Burrow. Like, is that a ludicrous thing to think about, or is there like could, could you actually make a case for that? No, I think you can absolutely make a case for that because you know I think uh, you can make the case that okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get, you know, let's say they make the decision to, to bring back T and they're like, all right, T is going to be a part of our future for a long time. And we're going to, we're going to get this thing done. You can do that and say, all right, you know, Joe, here's what we're working with and go to Joe Burrow. Cause that's the deal where if you're going to give a guy a 10 year deal and you need to, you need to fudge the numbers a little bit different years to kind of make the math work that you can do that. It's a little bit harder to do that when, you know, you're not going to sign T Higgins to a, a $11 million deal or 11, 11 year deal, excuse me. So <laughs> I, I think, um, I think it does. I mean, I think it makes sense to do Burrow first. I think it makes sense to do Higgins first. I don't think either one of them is really insane. Yeah, I, I agree with what Andrew was saying. I, you know, I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but I also don't think they would sign T Higgins uh, with not knowing what they're going to do with Joe Burrow. So whether it happens first or second, I don't, think it necessarily matters you know they're gonna have a plan in place um and we'll see how quickly that all comes together obviously you're here in the next couple of months so you're saying like if you know there's a world where they sign t higgins first like by that point they already know what's gonna happen with joe Burrow. Right. like it's done it's just not announced yet well maybe not done but they have the parameters of the deal so it's just a matter of figuring out you know the final parts of it yeah i mean like yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. If, if t higgins is gonna make you know, $24 million one year or, you know, one year his salary is higher than the next or whatever. I mean, you can, you can kind of work borrow around that. Yeah. And then I think, you know, if you want to kind of pl plug and play some numbers, you can kind of guess like, okay, well, now that you know what T is making, here's what Joe would make. And based on what he's making, what I mean, what T is making in this year versus this year, you, you can kind of be a mathematician and figure out, okay, maybe this is where the Bengals are kind of leaning. Maybe wait against like Brad Spielberger's projection, which, I mean, apparently has Burrow making fifty-three and a half million a year, which would make him the highest-paid quarterback annually. So who knows? That is actually an interesting projection. Projection, and I had a prediction on that that I wrote about earlier uh, last week. On that note, but uh, to kind of wrap up, speaking of Joe Burrow, we gotta save our best for last. Um, I don't know if you guys are big UFC guys. I'm kind of indifferent, but Joe Burrow is a huge UFC guy. He's always wearing UFC hoodies. He's always at UFC matches, and he was at the UFC 287 Championship, which. I think it was in Las Vegas. I'm not sure. They usually do it in Vegas. Miami. Miami. Okay, yeah. It's usually Vegas or Miami. It was in Miami. He was with Sam Hubbard. He was with Justin Jefferson, his old college teammate. And uh, he had an <laughs> interesting reaction when Israel Adesanya won his match. Uh, and that was pretty crazy. It was like a four-minute, 21-second knockout. And I'm just thinking, like, Joe Burrow really loves UFC. Again, big fan. He's not shy about it. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, you, you look at players and things they do off the field. Like talk about Travis Kelsey being an entertainer. He had that one TV show, and then he's on SNL. I mean, like, could you imagine a world where, like, Joe Burrow is just, like, a UFC fighter? Like, could, could you actually – not literally, but, like, if, if you were to, like, throw him in a ring and put him in a UFC match, like, could you see him, like, kicking some iron? No. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. You don't, you don't think he's got that feistiness in him? <laughs> he's, he's a quarterback in the end. Like, like, look, Joe Burrow's a competitor. Joe Burrow's not a UFC fighter. I don't know, though. I feel like if you put him in the zone, like, you know, he's that kind of guy where you tell him to do something, he'll do it. Like, I think if he really wanted to, I'm saying if he wanted to, and you put him in that ring, I don't know, man. I think you got, I think you got like a little dark horse there in the ring. I don't know. And so. <laughs> so it's bro it's just like this is like what we did last week with the basketball team like where we made our own Bengals basketball team i'm not saying he is gonna go ufc i'm saying if he did like would it make sense kind of like how i had him being a point guard on a basketball team like he's not gonna do that because he's oh, he's a quarterback but like he was a point guard at one point so maybe he likes ufc so much that like if he didn't play basketball or football maybe we would be watching welterweight matches of joe bro in a ring Maybe I'm just crazy, and maybe I'm just spitballing at this point, which I probably am. And I think we're going to end on that note. Um, 
But I, I love these questions, seriously. I, I just I love it because I love seeing your all's reaction and how we acknowledge I'm the weird one out of the bunch, which is why this podcast is amazing. Um, stay with us. We've got more amazing stuff this week uh, on the podcast. We're going to look back at the best decisions that have worked out for the Bengals in favor of Joe Burrow. Look at some other positional needs in the draft, including the one that no one is talking about. We'll tell you what that is later this week. Uh, before we let you go, make sure you sign up for our uh, Strictly Stripes newsletter. Uh, if you want to get a newsletter in your inbox every morning with all of the news and reports from me, Mike, and Andrew, uh, go to cleveland.com slash newsletters. Click on the Strictly Stripes newsletter. Sign up. It's free. Um, takes literally seconds. It's worth it right in your mailbox. No hassle whatsoever. Once again, for myself, Andrew, and Mike, I'm Muhammad Amal. See you